Hello, I'm gonna try to do something here with um a reviewing, doing a video review of modules for D and D, uh, and specifically the Adventure League. And I felt the best way to start this off would be to review starting at the beginning of the current season, which is season seven, focusing around Chult and the book The Tomb of Annihilation, which is a big uh, homage to Tomb of Horrors, which they released earlier in Season 6, although I always felt that it was really toned down in uh, for 5th edition compared to previous editions. Well, anyway, uh, Season 7 focuses around a big thing called the Death Curse. There's this curse going on that doesn't allow people to come back from the dead. That This is the kind of a thing that's people in Forgotten Realms and most D&D universes uh, could, if they had the money, just pay to come back. And this was a big thing for, was a complaint for 5th uh, edition in Adventure League that dying had no repercussions. So what they did was they added in this thing called the Death Curse, which basically while it was going, you couldn't be brought back. You had they had this thing called surrogates, which were pre-made characters made by uh, the Adventure League people or Wizard of Coast. I don't know which one's which, but uh, if you died, uh, you could either start a brand new character and your previous character was dead permanently, or you could take a surrogate, and the surrogate, uh, you would play the surrogate. Um, it was very restricted, and you. Uh, wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get feats with it, and it was it generally they weren't really that great. And a lot of times I had uh, a few people who just basically were like, "Oh well, my character's dead. I'm gonna just bring in a new character or stop playing." I had one person bring in a previous character from previous games he played in. Uh, and another person quit my group because his character died and he didn't want to use any of the surrogates. Well, anyway, so that's a big thing that's happening. Uh, and uh, if you play the Guild Adept Cellar Death, it kind of leads up to uh, pointing that Chult uh, Island Peninsula. I'm not really sure. It looks like a peninsula on the map but in other places it's referred to as an island uh, is the source of where the death curse is because leches don't like this death curse either because taking the souls away from them they need to sustain themselves so uh, you all head into Port Narnzaru and because of all the stuff that's going on uh, Port Narnzaru has a bunch of problems and this leads to a city on the edge which is this adventure uh, this, if you have ever done any previous uh, seasons, you would generally know that um, the beginning of Venture, seven, uh, the first one, uh, DDAL or DDEX, for the first three seasons it was DDEX, but is DDA, uh, the first adventure was always five mini adventures uh, that were breaking up into one hour modules, which were great for just jump and play at cons and stuff like that uh, and also just if people want to get a feel for a character uh, generally this one actually allowed you to go up to fourth level generally they were just first to second uh, season four and season six were the exceptions where they were actually full adventures for the first one but those were very different seasons so anyway this one's a little different from the other seasons that this one actually uh, the five, generally the adventures, uh, five adventures would be individually, like you could run them at any time. There was no set order you had to do them in. Uh, this one, exception, that the fifth one was generally done last after you did the other four. And each one was tied to a specific faction. Uh, this one was written by Rich Lesu Flair. Hopefully said his name right. But anyway, so 
the big thing, uh, the death curse. So anyone who has been reduced to zero, hit point maximum has been reduced to zero, is, will die immediately. Permanently reduced hit point maximums cannot be restored. And a door cannot be brought up to life by any means possible. Resurrection, raised it, etc. And those that have already died begin to wither away. And this is, uh, you lose 20 to your max HP, and then every day you would lose another point of HP. Uh, until you would drop to zero and then die. Uh, the only way to stop this was to uh, beat the book or hit tier three. Or now there's a thing called uh, skipping where you basically wait it out. But if you wait it out, uh, your character can't do the book anymore or any tier one or tier two for season seven. Which is a shame because some of the tier ones and tier twos are pretty fun. So there's kind of like a little intro thing, and this is just kind of to introduce players to Cholt and Port Nier and Zara, which everything is taking place in. Uh, there is the five factions, and it kind of tells you like the first one's Lord's Alliance, the second one is Zentarim, third one is Enclave, fourth one is Port of Gauntlet, and the fifth one is Harpers. Uh, the first one, like generally, they're pretty easy. The first one. Uh, Lord's Alliance is really cool, uh, really easy for the most part. I I did have a time where I had my players sweat a little over the last fight, but it was generally um, uh, generally they were never in fear of dying. Um, there is some exploration involved. Uh, and there is combat and a little bit social. Like the social can be skipped, the part of social can be skipped. But uh, if you want to kind of get people into it, that's uh, you can do that. And then uh, the second one, the Zentarim one. I I like Pockmark Poe. He's one of my favorite characters of all the faction people. Uh, Soggy Ren is also pretty fun too to uh, role play as. But uh, his is, they, they have a little mini game that you play in that one. Uh, and I actually kind of enjoy it. You get a bunch of new actions you can do as you're on a, uh, doing a race. And then you have a combat afterwards. Emerald Enclave is generally just, the ones are all, uh, it's most, there's some trap finding, uh, survival stuff, and then combat. It kind of also introduces you to a, a very common fauna of Cholt. And then Order of Gauntlet. This is Order of Gauntlet 1 is. Uh, which one is it? It is. Oh, this one. That one is actually. Uh, <laughs> that one could be tough. Uh, there's trap. There's a lot of traps. There's a few combats. It can that one can generally run a little bit over. That one and the last one, the Harper one, uh, generally runs over. Um, the center rim one. The first three are generally I can get done in the one hour that's prescribed for. But or the Gauntlet one has a lot of stuff going on in it, and the Harper one also has a lot of stuff going on in it. In it, I I like this one a lot. Uh, the death curse kind of scares people away, though. They don't like their characters permanently dying, so you can have issues with people just being like, you have a choice between this one or Treasures of the Broken Horde. People generally go for Treasures of the Broken Horde because they are afraid of the death curse, which is a shame. All in all, I really like it. Uh, each it it tells a cool story, has a lot of people bringing stuff in and um, it really kind of is cool that you can uh, see a whole bunch of different parts of Port Nui and it's a very good introduction to if you're going to do the book next to do this because uh, the first chapter of the book isn't much it is just a setting with a bunch of very loose plot points. 
this could easily replace it and you'll have people at 500 XP at the end of it which is a first level and if you especially run solar death before it people will be like level 3 which is the kind of the aim for getting out of there so you do solar death do this then go to the book this is a very good stepping stone uh, and unfortunately no magic items for this uh, the amount of money is eh. It's very good for a downtime day though, because each one gives you five, so that players will have 25, which is uh, generally they have five per two hours. This is each one's one hour, so you get five, but you get five as if you played two hours. And downtime later becomes a pretty hot commodity. At this point, I'm going to go deeper into what the adventure is, so if you don't want spoilers, uh, you should stop the video now. So the first one is called the Snake in the Grass, and this one is you're basically simp. You meet this guy, uh, Clavin Van Sharon, and he shows up a lot in other adventures. Uh, the seven two, uh, some tier two adventures, tier three adventures, he shows up in. Uh, he was in any tier four, but he he came from the Sword Coast and fell in love with Cholt. That he's kind of a Cholt enthusiast, so he's like he wants to sell you Cholt stuff. And he wants to talk about Cholt, and if you talk to him in Cholt, and he will really like you. So that he's very enthusiastic. But anyway, he's heard rumors that there is like a smuggling code nearby and he sends your people out to do that uh, do the find what they're trying to smuggle and clear out the cove if possible so this is the next part is you actually go to the place and it's to Trika Anchorage which is kind of the outer city it's one of the places outside the actual city walls so it is uh, not protected from the zombie hordes and if there was a serious attack uh, the people stuck there would be in trouble but it's also because it's out there it's not really well protect uh, watched over so a lot of smugglers get into that area so this is where uh, the social thing I was telling you about because there's these three brigands and they'll try and uh, they will try and scare your characters away but you can decide you can let a talker player try and convince them that mm, to let them through. You can bribe, uh, convince that you're part of the smuggler group, stuff like that. If not, you have the combat. Of course, if they talk through it, reward them the XP to get through the encounter. Don't like punish them for being smart about it or being chatty. And don't all instantly try and make it combat. Let them have a chance to do the talking. Uh, so, and it's actually said that right here. Uh, it's a really cool thing, the trick of the trades. I, I really approve of that. Uh, adding this in to the adventures now. Uh, is, I believe it's maybe six. I didn't pay too much attention to season six, but. Uh, I noticed this really a lot in season seven, where they have the uh, tricks of the trade, which tells you how you can run the adventures and if stuff if you feel it's going to be too easy for players, how to make it more difficult. But anyway, you go down below, and it's, this is the exploration point. Uh, the exploration point is basically going through. The this area, uh, this tunnel, you find a storage room and stuff like that, and then after that is a hallway. And if you don't have anyone looking, there's traps that will be set off. And also, you go looking, there's a little bit of a reward for players. Uh, if you go and look a little harder, you can find a secret door, and the secret door will. Also have a trap in it. It's a different type of trap. And if you get around it, 
and you do I, I honestly think that this should be a little more easier to find uh, maybe a passive perception turn that into a passive perception with this uh, the perception check because they already looked for the trap so they're not going to expect to have to look again to find this treasure and then you get into this other this is a complex trap or well it says it's a simple trap so what happens is you get to the double doors and if you don't deactivate properly you start filling up the thing with water and everyone it fills up quickly so there is a dex check or take damage it's all or nothing and then and this this kind of leads into the next thing because the final combat's right afterwards so if you get softened up a little by this that could be trouble so and then falling around much of the chambers filled with water uh, and if they don't solve it by the end it's a pretty easy con save in all honesty a DC 12 or a several point of exhaustion which really kind of pointless because one point of exhaustion is a disadvantage on ability checks and there isn't m much that's needed for combat uh, unless someone's a grappler this would suck for someone who's a grappler but one point of exhaustion is nothing unless you're planning to actually have some some check afterwards or well actually no I forget um, exhaustion is actually pretty good because that point of exhaustion will be a disadvantage for initiative checks so that could that could be punishing so there is the countermeasure uh, you do a perception or investigation check if, if you can find it and then the lever deactivates a trap but after four rounds so this is after they make a con save the water uh, the stone slab breaks and the water pours out uh, and of course this is you get XP if you don't stop the trap and the final combat is you fight a mage along with two brigands and a ruffian uh, the mage can be rough especially with level ones because she has the she has magic missile which is pretty nasty I would generally start off with she doesn't she should have mage armor going right away but because she only has 12 armor class 22 hit points if they focus on her she's gonna be dead in a round generally that's what has happened and also she has garbage cantrips shocking grasp so you're pretty much she's gonna probably be dead anyway by it uh, second or third turn everyone focuses on mages but if you feel you have a powerful group have a precast a mage armor otherwise uh, go for she can go for the person that you think will be the most dangerous like she'll probably aim for maybe the fighter with hold person or a barbarian they probably don't have a high wisdom check so that will get them and then they can magic she can magic missile the caster or someone so that that's a lot of damage to one person or she could do two to one and one to another uh, if she feels if you feel that uh, dropping someone for sure isn't the right way to go uh, so after the combat uh, the yeah, because this is what it says right here. If you guys alerted them, she has major armor up. If you bring her down to 10, she will surrender. She'll give you the MacGuffin. And she'll give you the money that you'll get anyway, even if you kill her. And then this is the fun part. So if you go, if the characters look and they generally do 
you find a small crate that contains a Velociraptor egg. This is the story reward that you get. Uh, so generally people roll off on this. And it's kind of like Season 5 also had this where you got a tiny bear. But this one you get a, a stunted pygmy Velociraptor. And I really wish I could find a correct version of what a Velociraptor actually looks like. So I could actually have one. Because I like to collect actual physical representations of the pets I have. And I actually have this on my fighter. And then if you did kill her uh, and you found the key in the first storage area when you went down the after beating the first group, uh, or you can de easy dex check with a, a thief tool, uh, any person, any if you have a rug in your group, that's a very easy check. They just have to roll seven or higher unless they really messed up their stats. And get 10 gold, potion of healing. So, all together, you do everything. It's 50, 10. So, you get 100. You only get 100 XP. And that's super easy to get, especially if you do any of the traps. And then, so it's 50, 60, 5, 75, 90, 100. So, 100 gold. So, normal group, that's 20 gold per person. And then, here's it cute and scaly. Found a Velociraptor, hatches in a week. It doesn't attack, defend, or provide aid in combat. It's no deadlier than a domesticated cat, house, dog, or cat. You can train it if you spend 20 downtime days to rec recognize your name and do s simple tricks. And you get five downtime, and Lords of Lions get one right now. And that's pretty much it. There's the map, shows you the traps. And you can draw I like this is actually really good. I like this map because it actually well I would prefer if the um the hex hex system went on the other side. Maybe a little lighter, but if it was on the other side it would help me with scaling everything out. So if I actually drew it as is it uh it would be much easier. And then final twist, do the same thing. Uh, there's a little handout. This is what you get if you defeat her. You find this. Hence this thing that's never referenced again. Like if you look into it, this group is never referenced in the book or any other module. So Big old red herring. Second one, Grand Prize the Oracle. So this is my favorite one. Pogmar Poe. This guy, he's he uh, he had, he got sick. He's pockmarked, obviously. Like he his face is heavily scarred from his illness. He's nearly blind in one eye. He has a he walking's painful for him. So he's uh. He uses servants to do all his work, and all of them are women. But uh, he's kind of this guy that everyone kind of uh, doesn't think much of, and he likes it that way. So, and he's really nice, and he expects everyone to not take him super seriously. And when they do that, he will take advantage of them and he does show up he shows up he i think he's the most common maybe saga friends also very common but he shows up a lot in the other modules and he also shows up in the first epic i don't think any of the other ones are really referenced at all in the um perils of the port epic just pockmark poe so he has a competition for you guys to do and he does it first you do a race and then you do combat and the race is pretty cool so you get let's see so you get this little map you set up you put the 
players here and you put the NPCs there and they have to race to the fit end and you can always move one and then you can take an action and the actions are so you got dash which is an animal handling check uh, so wisdom animal handling and this lets you move uh, additional space and that's so you can move th do that twice and failed dashes do not count but that does count as your action you can jab and you'll attack someone with a core staff uh, and they have to make a deck save, they fail, they lose a turn of movement. You can taunt and you make a intimidation check. So this is someone for charisma. So if you have someone good with wisdom, you want to kind of bank on them doing the animal handling. If you have someone who's good with strength and not wisdom, probably want to do this. If you have someone who's good with charisma, you probably want them to do this. And they basically charisma check against their insight check. Uh, which is provided back here. They are the Green Viper Scouts. So this is uh, what you use for all the stats when they're making checks. They actually have a decent animal handling of a plus three. But everything else is pretty garbage. They got plus one for against the... Uh, and they have a plus two save against uh, making against uh, being jabbed. Uh, so they have a plus one, make an inside check. If they fail, they're disadvantaged on any checks made during the next obstacle. And then trip. Uh, this one, you use athletics or acrobatics. So this is this is something where an acro a dex person will have a chance to do. So really, the only person who kind of gets looked over in this combat in this event part is. Anyone who's like int based, the int based person doesn't really have much to do, uh, which I think is actually one person who complained about this thing was specifically a wizard, and I could see where he was coming from, but I do not know how they could have really added anything in. It. So, like a wizard or someone who specialized on int could do something unique. This, but like everyone else, every other stat that really mattered uh, for this has something they can do. And this one, so they make another wisdom saving throw and they fail, they lose a position. And then at the end, um, I generally do this at the end of everything after all the players go, then I do the obstacles. So I have that all the players roll uh, d20. And they roll below an 11, something happens, and this can really hurt them. And this also happens to the NPCs too. So uh, generally, though, whenever we do the races, it is so one-sided for the players. The NPCs generally do not really get that close. I got one where they did get close, but still, every time I ran this, which was like four times, that the players won. So they win. They meet this person named Narissa. Uh, she has an offer for them. And you guys can choose if you want to take it or not. But she's kind of silent about it. A lot of players kind of get up on her grill about that, saying, Well, we don't want to agree to give you this if you won't tell us what she's about. She'll, if you persuade her, charisma check, she can uh, tell you she works for a Harper agent. And they didn't do the fifth one yet, which they shouldn't, because this fifth one should be only after you run all these other ones. Should, you would know about Soggy Ren. And a big point is the thing that she wants is not related to the thing that Pockmark Poe wants. And she'll give you extra money. So there's really no reason why the players should not agree to help her out. Uh, and it, she sh shows up win or lose. Uh, if you lose, 
uh, I guess Nerissa was part of the Green Vipers, so she will have your character sub in for him for the final combat, so you get in. Uh, so basically, this you need to accept her to actually continue the adventure. Otherwise, the players are done and they lose the adventure. So uh, then you have the combat, which is can be very nasty. It is you're facing off against a Kenku. Who generally is nothing. He's generally not that dangerous, but his Velociraptor pets are super danger deadly. Uh, they don't have much HP, but they have they have two attacks, and if there is another Velociraptor nearby, they have advantage on all the attacks. Also, if you do the higher difficulties, there is a Dinocus. He does not have that, but he has pounce, and he hits for a little bit more. But the Velociraptors are really nasty. Uh, at new players, if you're doing with level 1s and 2s, the Velociraptors would just can if they get the initiative, which they do have a plus 2. So they do have a decent chance of having a high initiative if you roll good. If they get the first turn, they could probably drop a person if they all focus on one person. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want to really make the players squirm, spread them out, but kind of put the Velociraptors uh, touching both targets, so each Velociraptor has pack tactics, but don't like all make them attack one person. Unless someone's stupid and runs up, spends a turn running up to attack them, hits the Kanku, then yeah, Velociraptors unload. So you defeat him, after you defeat him, you get 20 gold pieces, uh, then you meet one of the princes, uh, Kuwaiafe, she gives, she explains that she got this gift from many of her suitors, she has no need for it, and puts her at unease whenever she looks at it. Uh, this really plays in when you get to knowing about the next two parts really play into how, because all these pieces are part of the same artifact. So you give Nerissa her thing, she gives you more money, so you get like 90 plus 20, 110 gold. So that is 12 gold, no, 22 gold each, and easy, like Kanku's 50. Use 250 from the combat, and then 50 from that. Well, that's 50 for every player. So if you have, a, you could if you had a seven-person table actually, but you would be facing a Dinakis. With a seven-person table, at least so it's 250, 300, 300 divided by seven. Uh, you might be at 90 with that, but usually everyone should be at max, get max XP, you get the thrill of victory, uh, allows you to have advantage of charisma checks, persuasion, when you deal with any resident of the market, merchants, or harbor ward. Generally, I just apply this to any person they meet, unless it's specifically like in the old district or something like that. <clears throat> so, like if you deal with anyone inside the city proper, you have advantage of the charisma, uh, once a day, you have advantage of charisma persuasion check with them. And center rims get a renown this time. Alright, this one, next one, life as we don't know it. So this one, eh, I feel this one's the weakest of them all. So you meet uh, Screaming Wind, she's a Tabaxi, or a Khajiit, whichever you prefer. Uh, something's going wrong with the plant foliage in the area, and it's actually growing into the 
the area that you're in called Malar's Throat, which is this giant valley. Well, it's more like a crevice. It the buildings look like those. Uh, I forget what the southwestern Indians that built the villages on the side of mesas. Yeah, that's what the, it's kind of pretty much. That's what it looks like on both sides. There's buildings on the sides of this sheer cliff, and there's rope bridges going back and forth. This is another area where poor people live. Uh, uh, many times referenced in other locations that they are very susceptible to zombie and wildlife attacks. So anyway, you're sent to investigate the jungle. Go in. Uh, there, if you do not buy insect repellent, there is, which is actually from the book, but if you run any other previous ones, parts in between, you could spend the down, you can spend money to buy stuff from the book like insect repellent, which would ab avoid that. But it's a deck save. If you're infected with a minor disease, uh, you have disadvantage on all perception checks and investigation checks. So that means their passive goes down by five. It's a big thing to remember. Also, there is this weed thing. This kind of hurts you up, guys, up a little more. This poison, though, for 10 minutes, that's nothing. Unless you want to do that right before the combat. But even then, mm, poison, if you do the that poison thing and right after you do the combat, that might make this combat a little tougher. It's not really tough. Blights are nothing besides annoying. Although, I've had one time where... They actually killed someone. But that was some serious rolling going on. So, after that, after you defeat the Blights, you free a guy who tells you a little more about what's going on. He is very tough uh, to actually make him aid you. Otherwise, he's DC 18 at this rate. Anyone, like, if you decided to have, you have to roll an 11. If you had expertise with persuasion, you would have to roll 11 to get him. Otherwise, the best is a 13 on the die. To make that 18 persuasion check. But usually most people just ignore him, let him walk off. He gives you a potion of poison resistance. That helps though, because what you face next, well, there's poison. And this ever actually do anything much. If you had that thing's disease, this could and no one does anything. You can easily uh get caught in this and you face grung so grungs are frog people so karma the frog but evil they are very selfish they are very manipulative so generally I have them show up as acting totally nice these there's you see the far small humanoids uh, around a small decorated stone a block in the center of a small pool of water so I just kind of have the frogs pointing to it and kind of motioning to people to go over to it. Uh, generally just not hostile. They look very kind of friendly, I say. Just to kind of get someone to get caught in it. Because that's the only way to get the story award. Uh, so you make a wisdom saving throw. And this is when combat starts. If anyone, when they make the saving throw, after that happens, the grungs will attack them. 
but anyone who fails is charmed, and the Grungs will attack the party immediately afterwards. And then they got some money, and they get an amulet piece, which you'll realize is part of the other pieces. And there's a big old, well, this one kind of actually, a little bit of a hint toward what's going on with this whole entire adventure. So, with the Grungs, you, you have the, what is it, Grungy, so, there's four Grungs initially, and they are 50, so that's 200, and there was these 300, 350, so, that is 50, 25, yeah, that would be 75, for the seven party team, oh well, if it was full team. Yeah, it's easy. You can get it. Maybe 95. Let me see. It's 200, 300, 350. If you're doing it at. Two needle lights, two twig lights. Yeah. So. 150 plus 200, 350 divided by 5 is 70. To get 95 XP. Uh, also, there is something I forgot to mention with the Death Curse. Uh, there's a thing called Meat Grinder. You can take this, activate it. Once it's activated, it stays active until you hit, until the soul, uh, the Death Curse goes away, and you have your death saves go up to 15. So instead of having to make a 10 on your death save, you have to make a 15 on your death save. Uh, but you get 10% gold and 10% more XP from it. Which doesn't really mean much to really in the long term of it. But I just like to do it for the, the death save and make it stuff more tough. I like tough. And you get the snakes on the brain. Mostly store uh, RP. Nothing really comes of it. This one, Emerald Enclave, get it. Five more downtime days. But like this is actually a lake there, and that's a little stone in the little in the middle. Generally, I have the water not just be like knee deep, so it's not like you have to deal with all that too. Death calls. This one. This one is already. On. This one, Alistair Bull, he shows up a lot too. Actually, he might be up there with Poe with how often you come across him. But he's a big old sweaty guy. He does who likes to eat too much and he doesn't like being in Cholt. Cholt is a downgrade to him, so Definitely, when you're playing his character, make it kind of open that he detests being here, but he's kind of forced to do it. But anyway, he lost someone. There's been strange occurrences. He sent someone to investigate it. That guy's gone. He wants you guys to investigate it. The old city. This is the old city. So you can actually talk to Poe, which is brought up here. Talk to Poe to get some information. He'll tell you all this. Which is people just basically are walking away, uh, talking about death calling out to them. So it's known as Call the Dead. Ooh, name. <clears throat> Dario, this is the guy you're looking for, was in the area. Then he disappeared. And they'll point you to one of the ziggurats, the smallest one, which is near Execution Run, which wasn't really brought. Like when I first ran this, the book wasn't out yet. Uh, so I didn't know what it was, but it's actually the place where they throw criminals in and they have to try and escape before raptors kill them or other dinosaurs. So you come to this place, there's two huts, big one and a small one. Small one, if they get close, has zombies inside, or if you go to the big one, the zombies come out when you start looking at it. Uh, searching through the hut, there's a bunch of stuff. 
there's a gnome dude who's been investigating this thing he's got. I think Ziplo. So it says it here, but they also have it back here, so you can give it to the character players. And basically, at this point, uh, they give you a little clue about uh, how to disarm the uh, find the secret entrance inside the cigarette. So you do that, and there is this trap. So let me explain this trap to you. So this trap is pretty much like it hints to because there will be basically four entrance four doors people can choose, and I didn't actually do this very well. Also, there's a trap in the middle of the room, so people have to be careful about this trap in the middle. Uh, trap goes off. Next to rooms, each marked with a T. So, so the the thing is, so if success reveals a tracing the correct path along the carvings, but they're Fingers causes a secret door on that wall to open, identical in size, but this time with a small with wall carvings on three out of the four walls. So you have the three exact same wall carvings, and you basically have to get. So it says an arrow points to the bottom left circle, and beneath it are the words to begin here. So, you go here, and you're supposed to. Players are supposed to realize they're supposed to go to the left one because they're coming in from here. That will be on the left, and then this one's pretty easy. It's on the right, and uh, then you have to go to this one. So if they choose one of the wrong ones, the trap goes off. They choose the wrong door because each of those sides have look exactly the same. So each of these look exactly the same. And these two they look exactly the same. So they have to kind of figure that out. That's left, right, left, or it's left, right, and right again. And then you get in here, which is where combat begins again. And generally it's this guy he's easy. Ziplo, 9 HP. He doesn't. He doesn't last at all. And he has shield, but he only has AC of 10. So if you hit a 16, or actually if you hit a 15, he can't do anything. But he had a decent firebolt if he hits, but he only has a plus 4 to hit. So best thing to do if you want to cause problems. He has burning hands, but generally if he does that, he is done. Uh, if it's too tough, you can bring in Nerissa. She'll show up to help out because in that final combat there is a bunch of undead there is four zombies 22 HP and hard to kill unless you have someone with sacred flame so so you open the gate and the zombies actually go to so right here is three people. In the middle is Dario. The zombies will start walking toward the people, even unless they are attacked by someone. So they will ignore the characters and will move toward the people. Generally, I just have them have one turn where they move, and then the second turn they will kill the person. Starting on the outside, so leaving Dario alive. So. Yeah, basically here he casts Firebolt. He tells you to cast Firebolt, and he casts Burning Hands. Uh, he has three quarters cover from range attacks, so that will give him like plus four, plus four to AC. He has a fourteen AC against range attacks, but generally we he is generally just done. Like people hit him with uh. Magic missile, and he's gone. 
and they only have 2 HP, a single attack from any zombies killed them. Or at least drop them down to zero. Probably a walkway, or two ramps. Oh, this is also a big thing. The dexterity saving throw. If you fail, you slip to the bottom taking d4 damage and are prone at the end of their movement. So that could be a problem. Forgot about that part. That you can slip and slide down in here. There's also these side paths, but the side paths take too long. So if, but this is a, you possibly, well no, Ziplo. If you hit him, generally have Ziplo do the pull the thing no matter what. Even if you kill him, you pull his dead body falls on it, triggers the trap. People need to fight the zombies. Unless you just really want to reward them for being really stealthy. And that's pretty easy. Uh, there's three zombies and four more. So seven zombies, 350. Then Ziplo's 50 more. So that is 254. Five is 80. If you rescue all the prisoners, that's 30 more XP. If so, if Dara doesn't die, you get an extra 10. So, with that, you're 30, and you're definitely going to get max XP from that. Uh, quest reward 60, 60, 70, 100, so 20 gold per character. You get scroll protection evil good, really good. This is garbage. This is so much garbage. Scroll healing word. Healing word. A bonus action. Scrolls always takes an action, so this would only be good because they only cast at first level too. If you really needed to bring someone up who was dying, and like they were one death save away from being dead permanently, and you couldn't reach them by movement. Alchemist fire, so. Or the gauntlet. So then we move on to the fifth part. So this one is a culmination. You meet Soggy Ren, you meet Narissa again. Uh, they bring up the Atepka Society, which is nothing. No relevance in anything AL wise. Uh, there is they mentioned that the harbor master is one member, but it doesn't really mean anything. I guess maybe with one of the plot hooks that are in the book, this would help, but it's really garbage. So you run all the other four parts, and you get these four pieces, and Sagiran puts them together and forms this amulet, and it's supposed to be dangerous, so he wants you to give it to a member and. You can have no wrestle be with you, but generally uh, have an NPC unless your party is really unoptimized. You really don't need her. And it just takes up more time. So he gives you 100 gold to give it to a person. Go to him. Uh, anyone can realize, well, it's a, de it's a pretty high insight check. But if you look at it, it looks like he didn't really know what the hand sign meant. It was very unexpected to him. Uh, and then he takes you to this a warehouse and kind of leads you in and takes the thing and runs off. Of course, that could not happen. And I generally have him run away. Uh, so I have him like go up the stairs here, have the players here. He asks them for the amulet. If they don't give it to him, he'll just have the zealot, the two guys attack while he runs away. Or well, after he'll try and steal it and then run away. If it just seems too dangerous, he just runs away. Generally, this gets the players to chase after him because they just want to kill him. They hate most of them. Just hate it assholes like him. So uh, 
they you have that in the pit there's a snake and it is it's a giant poisonous snake this could be dangerous the poisonous snake does a lot of damage with its bite it's 3d6 and half as much on a successful save DC 11 cons generally pretty easy unless someone dumped con or has zero con yeah the initial bites not gonna be bad but if at higher difficulties you have a constrictor snake and that could be even more dangerous you have DM sir as an acolyte and then they're actually bandits they stick, they call them zealots but they're bandits they're pretty easy to kill but generally I have them up there just shooting until someone gets close to them they will take out a scimitar so after defeating them you have two options you have this door over here or this door where Diamsor ran away so at this point if Diamsor ran away the bad guy, big bad guy has the amulet already if not the players will come through the door and the bad guy will get the amulet as a free action Pretty sure that's what it says. So you have a Yanti Pure Blood and three Yanti Broodlings, which are pretty much brood guards. They just call them broodlings. I was like looked at them and I was like, what the hell is broodlings? I've never seen them before. And then I looked into it and it was like, oh yeah, these are just brood guards, just call them broodlings for some reason. But they're pretty easy deal with they they just have two attacks though so that could be a little bit dangerous uh, but when there's a trap at the beginning and if they fail the con save after going over the scores uh, they're considered poison so disadvantage on all their attacks I would make this an active perception just because it's such a low thing. And then right afterwards they can make a survival check. Then you can avoid them pretty easily. Oof, add two more poison snakes. So anyway, the amulet. Oh, he actually summons it as a bonus action. And he has a bunch of nasty little abilities you can do with it. Oh, and she has this thing. This never comes up because no one ever brings Marissa with them. But she gives advantage of the saving throws versus spell casting abilities. Well, where is the amulet part? Where's that? Where did it talk about the amulet? Still is a dandelion. So the ammo's power. We refer oh and the stat block. Oh here it is. So you can do crown of madness with it, ray of sickness, and sleep. Ooh, sleep. That's really nasty. Drop a sleep on people. Roll high enough, put a bunch of players to sleep. Ray of sickness actually does damage. Crown of madness is kinda of garbage. Crown of madness, some people like it. If you if a if the party is grouped up, Crown of Madness is good. Otherwise, it's garbage. He's a Yontai normally, but you can he can get downgraded if it's a very weak. I think nope. He's always a. So they actually have they're really easy to hit. AC only eleven, but they have forty hit points, so they can stay up for a while, especially at tier one. So after that, you finish the encounter. She tells Nerissa tells you that she used to be a warrior in Mesro. And she's been investigating 
which is interesting because Mesra doesn't exist anymore. So I don't know where she came from. And then they kind of reveal that the the whole other thing you do did was originally thought to be related to Death Curse. Now at the end, it's revealed that it has nothing to do with it. It is something totally different dealing with Yanti. And that's pretty much it. Uh, so, you get this story reward. Worthless. Doesn't do anything. I just walk around trying to show it to people, being like, hey, hey, you know what this is. But this would definitely give you max XP, gives you a good amount of gold, most amount of gold. So you pretty much come out with like 100 gold at the end of this, and 500 XP as a max. Uh, unless you are death cursing it, which are meat grinder, but you'll gain 110 each, so you'll be 550. A little bit ahead of everyone else, but not that much. Eh, as I said, doesn't give you that. You have a difference, and it's like 100 gold, 110 for 120 for. It's like a little bit of 100, over 100 for normal people, and death, meat grinders would be 120. Overall, very good. I like it a lot. This adventure is really fun. I like to run it. But as I said before, Death Curse going on. Not a lot of players like to play with the Death Curse, which is unfortunate. They are a bunch of wussies. But uh, that was my review for City on the Edge 7 1. Uh, I'm going to try and do this daily and get caught up on all the modules for Season 7. And yeah, I, I yep. Uh, see you next time.